everybody that <laughs> on this uh, wandering the world, uh, trying to bring about Julian's, well, I'm not going to say try, bringing about Julian's uh, release from jail. There's a couple of familiar faces here. There's Taylor Hudak every day for three weeks. I bumped into Taylor outside the court uh, in, uh, where is it, in the Old Bailey in London. What to do and what to say. There's only one road to freedom, and that's knowledge. That's the only road to freedom. And as you see, the first speaker outline knowledgeably the circumstance of the oppression and intimidation of a, a journalist. Gabrielle put some warm family details into that circumstances that have Julian's experienced these 12 years. That knowledge, the warmth and emotion with detail, and the intellectual content of the first speaker brings freedom. You can see and feel within yourself that that freedom arrives immediately. You know the circumstances. You know what states are involved, the Swedish, the UK. I'm not, I'll change that. You know what states are involved, the Swedish Prosecuting Authority, the Crown, UK Crown Prosecuting Service, and the Department of Justice in the United States. When it was decided to drag Julian out of the embassy, the 12 senators wrote to Marina, Lennon Marino, he was the president of Ecuador, they wrote to him and said that this is not good what you're doing. Then Mike Pence went down and had a chat with him. Mike Pence is a Christian evangelicalist, um, as is uh, Pompeo. The organizing group uh, for the attempt to extradite Julian Assange under the 1917 Espionage Act was organised by those people. Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, and a man named William Barr. William Barr, under the Bush the first, had a nickname, the Snatcher, because he was capable, determined, and willing to use the extradition treaties of the United States to kidnap judicially from around the world anybody that they wanted to bring to the United States for either political reasons, reasons of control of money, or technological reasons. That's, for example, Ming Wen Zhu of uh, Huawei, who's been judicially kidnapped in Canada and attempt to extract to the United States because Huawei has uh, technology that uh, certain people in the United States want. After the World War in 1945, the great cultural artifacts, because of the horror of that World War, came into being. The United Nations, where relationships between states would be governed by laws, really important. And there was a forum wherein they could make discussion and each would put forward their self-interest, and those self-interests could be negotiated and accommodated. Also came into being, was that in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the chair of which was no less than Eleanor Roosevelt. Also came into being in 1958, with the Conventions of Asylum, where states agreed that those that are put upon and find Sakur or asylum would be given guarantees of passage and protection. It was ratified under the Australian authorship in the General Assembly in 1973. The Council of Europe came into being, which is solely concerns itself with the human rights, and human rights legislation is embedded in every nation in Europe that is a member of the Council of Europe. That's 44 nations. For some reason or other, in 2001, 
the United States Empire decided that those glorious cultural artifacts that were put together under the terrible experience of 80 million dead and most of the world destroyed in a world war decided for reasons we can't understand they won't reveal, you can speculate on that all of these artifacts of culture created in the 20th century had to be abandoned in the 21st century and progressively they've done so with the United Nations ruled by laws which allows nations to put their self-interest forward and negotiate a, a solution they brought out something like what is called rules-based you might remember Mad Magazine from the 60s that had a comic strip in it uh, monthly. I rule okay, you rule okay, no rules okay. It's sort of comic, sort of infantile. And so it goes. The great symbol, the icon of that tragedy of abandoning these golden means, these wonderful artifacts of culture, the icon of that is the treatment of Julian Assange. Not one of the conventions of asylum was obeyed in, by the United Kingdom in the arbitrary detention of Julian Assange. Not one. And they're signatories. In fact, more than signatories, they're part of the authorship of the conventions on asylum. Not one. Procedural irregularities in Julian Assange's case are like a Niagara. They're just continuous. It's just a display of malice towards somebody who took seriously the great artifact of the United States as beginning, the First Amendment. He took it seriously and brought to us the knowledge how to understand, how to measure, and how to ask our governments what, what they're doing in our name, and not only that, how to intelligently participate in the creation of policies that suit us and make getting on with our neighbouring states easier and fruitful. Anyway, I've sort of come to the end now. But it's really important to keep in mind that ordinary things like the United Nations and the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Council of Europe, their goal and hanging on to them to ensure that states hang on to those means is our is iconographically when Julian's free gives us an opportunity to understand that it's our strength that brought about Julian's freedom and similarly it'll be our strength that insists that those wonderful artifacts of the 20th century continue, modified of course in the times, but continue on into the 21st century. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your reception and we crack on.